Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast, where we serve up answers for your cocktail questions, interview top industry professionals, and keep you up to date with what's going on in the world of craft cocktails. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And this is episode number two. Shiny number episode two. Fancy. So today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite spirits. I'm going to say this every single time. Um, They're all your favorite spirits. <laughs> it, it's like having kids. You just can't pick your favorite. Except for vodka. That one's... Not your favorite? No. <laughs> okay, we're not naming one of our kids vodka. Um, so today we're going to be talking about gin. Um, so last podcast we talked about vodka. And we kind of gave a insight onto. What we'd be talking about this time, because mm-hmm. it tastes like Christmas trees. Exactly. I don't know about you, um, th- that's, this actually came from me, because one of my girlfriends from college absolutely hates gin, for the reason that she says it tastes like she's chomping on a Christmas tree. And there's a lot to be said about that, actually. <laughs> yeah, um, Yeah, they definitely, some gins have a very tree-like flavor, actually. And a lot of, what I've found is that, in general, if you hear people say they hate gin, it's usually for that reason. Absolutely. So um, it can be a difficult spirit to get um, to get acquired to, but um, it has a lot of character, and it definitely stands out in cocktails. And that's why I love it so much, is it has a lot of personality that doesn't get right. covered up by other ingredients. And the good thing is, we'll talk in a second about different types, but um, be wary of just... Count, discounting all gin as being Christmas tree like. There's a huge spectrum in terms of how junipery the flavor is. And so there are some gins that, if you ask me, taste a lot like vodka. They're really, they're not very different in flavor. And then there's other gins that I like can't even get close to because it's like getting hit in the face with a Christmas tree. And at the end of the day, I mean, vodka is basically, you know, the baby of gin. It all starts <laughs> from vodka. And then once it grows up, it Kind of turns into gin, so... <laughs> so what's the what's the education process that vodka goes through to uh, become it's gin? It's it's very, very it's dark. Tough. Yeah, it's, it's bad. There's <laughs> uh, a hazing process. Exactly. How do we haze our vodka? So that brings up a really good point of just the basic overview of, you know, how it's made. Um, and I'm just going to be talking about the most classic, the one that everybody knows and understands, and that's London Dry. So, the other ones don't vary that much, do they? They do, actually. Oh, okay. They can. Well, we'll keep it simple. If you want to if you want to know the details on the other ones, um, we'll give you a link in the show notes to a place where there's a lot more detail. Exactly. So, uh, basically, when you order a gin and tonic or you order a Bombay Sapphire, or, you know, any of these other styles of, or names of gin, most likely you're ordering London Dry style gin. And London Dry is pronounced or um, it has a really big focus on juniper. So that's where the Christmas tree flavor comes in. Okay. Um, And essentially what happens is you start off with a neutral spirit. Vodka. Vodka. And you steep your botanicals in there, which are juniper, citrus, and other things. Does there have to be juniper? Like, by law, it has to be juniper? For London Dry, you are focused on juniper. Okay. Okay. That's what your focus is on. Do all gins, are all gins across the board made with juniper? There's... um, Except for New Western style gin. Okay, so there's no like governing authority of the world that says you can't call it gin unless there's juniper in it. Right. Okay. So I think. Actually, but for London Rye, definitely. You, for you London have Dry, to have definitely. Juniper in for okay. London Dry. Like the New Western style gin, um, there's a lot less focus on juniper. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's actually a law that you have to have juniper in that. Um, but. Yeah, so that makes a lot of sense. So, But anyway, we're talking about London Dry. So you, you throw it in a bucket with some juniper be- berries, right? Right, juniper berries. Okay, and then a bunch of other botanicals. So Typically citrus and herbs and other things. Dirt. Dirt, yeah. <laughs> I made that up. I don't think they a actually make femur. it with dirt. You know, just throw it all in there. <laughs> and basically you allow it to steep and kind of extract all those flavors into the alcohol. You just infuse it, essentially. So you make an infused vodka. Essentially. And then you run it through the still to increase the proof, and then you drop it down with water. That's how London Dry um, gin is made. So basically, if we go back for one second to how the vodka was made, we started off with kind of like, a, almost like a, a beer or wine, that was like potato beer. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. And then we took that and we distilled it down to increase the um, percentage of alcohol. Right. And then we may have added a little bit of water at the end to get to the final product. Exactly. We took that, Mm -hmm. we threw a bunch of herbal stuff and juniper berries in it, 
stirred it around, left it for a while, put it back in the still, distilled it down again, the result of which is, so now there's less of that water which we might have added, right? and more of the tasty good stuff that we infused into it. Exactly. So typically, you know, you're going to have a much higher proof than you are for bottling, and then you're just going to drop that down with water to bring it down to normal drinking strength. So... It sounds like gin is kind of like vodka tea. Essentially, it is. Yeah, huh. absolutely. Well, there's so. a business opportunity for us. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, to oversimplify dramatically, don't take my word for it. But a lot of the um, the new artisanal products that are coming out are gins because they're just so easy to make. You don't have to sit on them a long time. You don't have to barrel age them. So it makes a lot of sense. So you see a lot of... Um, artisanal vodkas and a lot of artisanal gins because you can put it out on the market very quickly. So these people are buying Neutral giant trucks of vodka, right. making tea, mm-hmm. distilling it, and selling it. Exactly. Well, that sounds like a fantastic business plan because you don't have to start all the way from potatoes. Exactly. And you don't have to sell on your product for years. Uh, that's um, a good point. There's so. no aging for any gins? Uh, you can age gins. Um, one of the newer trends in the market now is to actually age barrel aged some gins and it's it's a really intricate product i love it it's i'm really excited about i don't it. think i've tried that i don't think uh, i brought any home you it should didn't do make that. it all the way home <laughs> now wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> this happens a lot um, anyway when we have a chance to taste that we'll definitely let you know how it goes when i have a chance to taste that <laughs> sounds like chris might have already snuck some <laughs> so that's that's the main category of gin is london dry like i said if you order gin and tonic um, if you order a gin martini, most likely you're probably going to get a London Dry style. Now, there are quite a few other styles out there. Um, the very original style of gin was actually called Geneva. That's probably where the name can- gin came from. I would assume, I assume. so, yeah. yeah. And um, along the back then, they actually made it with malt, um, malted wheat. So it, it's kind of like this combination of whiskey meets gin with mm-hmm. a lot less juniper focus to it. So it's I really, find it, yeah, it's a little bit sweeter almost. It has some residual sugar mm-hmm. to it. And, um, you know, a lot of the really, really classic cocktails actually use Geneva instead of gin. Interesting. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you're going back to the 1900s, this, this was about the time when London Dry started to take over. So uh, if you're Geneva. making cocktails whose recipe were invented around that time, if you want a really authentic product, you should probably find yourself some Geneva. Exactly. Geneva. Got um, there's it. another one called Old Tom's. There's a whole history to Old Tom's. Oh, yeah. Which is really Nobody fun. likes that guy. Um, <laughs> Actually, I never met Tom. I can't speak to him. <laughs> He's probably a really nice guy. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's um, a different style of gin as well to keep, out, keep an eye out for. Um, Before we get off Geneva, though, I, I will mention one thing. It Both Geneva and Old Tom tend to be harder to find, especially for Geneva, right? They're extremely hard to come across. And We um, actually, <laughs> this is a funny story, we actually picked up the Geneva we have, which is, actually, I'm not sure the name of the brand we have, but we bought it in the duty-free aisle in uh, Amsterdam, Amsterdam yeah. Airport. And had a very heavy trip home. Yeah, <laughs> we bought awesome. several bottles. Every time you travel internationally with Chris, you end up with a lot of liquids on the way back. Um, so, yeah, we picked those up in Amsterdam, which is one of the birthplaces or one of the main producers of Geneva these days. So, you know, when in Rome. When in Rome, exactly. Geneva. Yeah, so anyway, the point, the point I'm trying to make is if you come across it and you're interested in trying it, just buy it. It's really hard to come by nowadays. It's getting more popular. Um, Bowls is probably the most common of the brands, but I know at least in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're starting to see a brand called Diep Nine as well. And, and that, that is a tasty. very, very classic um, Geneva. So it even comes in the clay bottle. Yeah, exactly. You should so, just buy the Geneva for the bottle. They're uh, like they're so cute. I know. I want to like grow things in them. Um, so yeah, traditionally they come in these really beautiful clay artisanal bottles, and the product itself is very different from even the Bowles Geneva. Much lower in proof, a little tad sweeter, much more malty, um, and we can go on for days about Geneva. It's like I, a girl gin. That's I, like Whenever I make anything with gin, I, I just go straight for the Geneva is what I typically do. But yeah, that's so. because I typically like sweeter and gentler drinks and not Christmas trees. So, anyway. And um, um, the last one that we'll talk about is um, one called, it's a fairly new category of gin called the New Western Style Gin. And this is kind of like a much more citrus-driven, a lot less juniper-driven. Um, one of the original 
um, producers of the style of gin is um, up in Oregon called Aviation Gin. And this product was actually started as a collaboration between a distiller and a mixologist. Interesting, which makes a lot of sense because I guarantee the mixologist hears all the time, I don't like gin. Right, and they have an insight into cocktail creation, so Absolutely. they know what kind of flavors are going to work and kind of what, what what we want in a product. So that was the first collaboration and the first kind of um, identity towards a new Western-style gin. And there's a couple other ones out there. Most famous is probably Hendrix, which is much more cucumber and rose petal uh, focus. I feel like you often see Hendrix in those cucumber cocktails that you find in the summertime. Sparkling water, cucumber, lemon. Absolutely. Hendrix. Yeah, it's much more light um, style of gin. And, you know, it's it's an easy transition, uh, especially if you're a vodka drinker, into gin, is to find one of these new Western-style gins. Uh, they like don't the taste aviation. that different to me. Yeah. and they I have, don't have the palate that Chris does, but they definitely don't have that really heavy botanical uh, flavor to them. They're very gentle. Um, they're I'm not gentle in terms of uh, proof, but gentle in terms of flavor. There's not a ton of flavor there. So it's kind of like a, uh, it's almost like a baby step into gin. It's like training wheels. Training in wheels. Yeah. Um, and one of my favorites is uh, a local distillery here in San Francisco called 209, much more citrus driven. Um, and all of these are really, really great gins to kind of pick out and add to your collection. So if we're talking about adding to our collection, one of the questions that I like to discuss in this setting is how do you shop for gin? Because I think it's a question that, well, well I, I've got a, uh, a get out of jail free card. I just go shopping with Chris and say, what should I buy? <laughs> but um, I often get text messages from my mother that, that are, hey, ask Chris what kind of gin should I buy or what kind of vodka or what kind of tequila. So um if you're shopping for gin and you walk down the supermarket aisle, like where do you start? Sure. So gin is a really reasonable product. You can get a really good quality gin for a pretty decent price. So, for example, if you get a bottle of Tangare, which is extremely juniper-focused, um, or even Bombay regular, Bombay Sapphire, you're probably going to spend about 15 to $20. So you can get a really high-quality brand for a really reasonable price. So you would say that those brands would be great, like nothing wrong with them, good standard issue. You're going to get a great drink out of it. Absolutely. You know, for your for your uh, gin and tonics, your aviations, um, any of those really great gin cocktails, they're going to have a lot of character and they're going to persist throughout the entire drink. They have a lot of personality. So, you know, for that price, great. you can definitely get a great gin for that. And so what would be like the absolute maximum you should ever spend on a 750 milliliter? So, I mean, you can spend as much as you want, but um, I think probably one of the more pricey gins on the market right now is probably Hendrix. Um, and it goes for around $30 a bottle for a 750 You know, you don't really want to spend more than that. I think... You don't um, have to. There's just so many to. good options under that price point. I don't right. really feel like... And, and I, I mean, maybe there are people out there who sip gin on the rocks, but I haven't met them. Right. And actually, that brings up a good point. There is a product that came out about a year ago. It's a gin that costs $800 a bottle. Oh, sign me up. And I tried it. And I mean, it's a good gin, but at the end of the day... Um, not that much I better. I would rather spend my money other places. So you can get a really good quality gin for, you know, not a lot of money. Excellent. I so, like those. <laughs> I like good quality, cheap ingredients. So today what we're drinking is actually a kind of a take on a classic gin cocktail. So we're actually drinking a French 74. That was my idea. It's actually called a French 75, but it's typically made with champagne and we didn't want to open a whole bottle of champagne right. so we made it with soda water so, so we're calling it a french 74 so we're taking a point off for we're taking a point <laughs> off for the soda water <laughs> it actually came out quite nice we didn't have to you i think you sweetened it a little bit more uh, to make up for the lack of the 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 um body that we're not getting out of the champagne right. but still very nice very refreshing it's a that's another warm day up in northern california for us so a nice um sparkling lemon gin cocktail was a good way to go absolutely and if so, you want to see uh, the recipe and or a picture of the cocktail definitely come check out this episode over at mixologytalk.com slash two yeah and uh some other like classic cocktails that you can use uh gin in are aviation um what's that one what's in it so aviation is does it fly actually the reason it got its name is because it looks like clouds 
Really? Mm-hmm. So it was I gin, totally was lemon juice, luxardo, and just kind of a small dollop of uh, creme de violette, which is typically purple, and it kind of creates that that sky hue, like almost blue. Huh. I did not is, know that. Um, Are you making that up? No. Oh, I wow. wish I was. That'd be amazing. <laughs> Um, no, that's great. You're going to have to make one of those for me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that means I have to go to the store again and buy some new product. Oh, Yay, no. Perfect. What have I done? So, And then uh, you also have the Vesper Martini, which is um, an orange aperitif wine, vodka, gin. And then a Martinez, which is sweet vermouth, uh, gin. A um, little bit of orange bitters, I believe, in there as well. And uh, Lemon Twist. Um, really, really classic, classic. Yeah, cocktail. they all sound great. Would you say that... Um, for these three we mentioned, the Aviation, the Vesper, and the Martinez, could you use any of these types of gin, or would you really focus, would you say, like, well, these are all pretty classic, so you should probably go for London Dry, or just pick what you like? I think you could definitely use gin, like any category of gin within these. I think there are certain um, cocktails that shine a little bit better with different um, styles of gin, like a Martinez, you probably want to use um, either an Old Tom's gin or even a Geneva. I think it would probably work out a little bit better. Um, Why is that? Just it, it's one of those classic old school cocktails. So you want to stay back with the classic exactly. old school gin? No, it, it's sense. kind of a riff on a Manhattan a little bit, and so either you that have all or that a Manhattan is flavors. a riff on it, right? Did right. Manhattan exist when the <laughs> Martinez was? That's actually a really invented? good question. <laughs> um, but you have a lot of those kind of same similar flavors playing off of each other. So you know you probably want something with a little bit more weight to it. Um, Definitely. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Cool. If you have any questions about gin or vodka, the one we talked about in the last episode, definitely come visit us over at mixologytalk.com slash two. There'll be a place on that page where you can click and submit either written questions or you can actually record your voice and record your question and we'll, uh, we'll play it on the air and uh, see if Chris can answer it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, next episode, we're going to be continuing our spirits kind of series, and we're going to be talking about a spirit that got me into a lot of trouble in college. That does not narrow it down at all. No, it really doesn't. It's- but uh, until then, I hope you guys have a great drink and cheers. Cheers. Have a good night, everyone. Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.